Welcome to the Texas Values Report. This is Jonathan Sines, president of Texas Values. Great to be with you on another glorious week in the state of Texas. It's good to be back in the state of Texas. I was in D.C. for some very important reasons, which I'll get into later in the show, but I'm glad to be back in my home state. Good to be with you this week. We've got a lot of important issues to cover. I know we're you know, really almost halfway through summer, if you will. Uh, it's hard to believe because many of us have not taken much of a break because of some of the work we do, but there is important work to be done. And I wanna talk a lot about that today. And there's important leadership uh, passing of the gavel, if you will, and new people that have come forward. And so that's gonna be a big part of our discussion today because Matt Rinaldi is gonna be our guest today on the Texas Values Report. Uh, chairman Rinaldi is now the chairman of the Republican Party of Texas. You know him too. He was a state legislature serving in our Texas House before from the North Texas area. We'll talk a little bit about his background and what's coming up next for the Republican Party. Chairman Rinaldi, welcome to the Texas Values Report. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. Well, look, you and I have known each other for a long time. We've done a lot of work together. Um, you know, I've been up in the district quite a bit. And so, but this is a new role for you. And, and just for our, our, our uh, viewers and listeners, if you're on Facebook, share this, like it, um, get it into your groups, because we're going to get into some very important information that's timely that you want to know about now. But I want to start with the role that you're now in, newly elected as the Republican Party of Chairman for the state of Texas. You have some background in the legislature. Um, you were in, very involved with the grassroots. That's how you and I got to know each other many years of, uh, ago in the North Texas area. But maybe people, uh, you know, it's been a year or so since they've interacted with you if they're not in the North Texas area. So talk to us a little bit about that background and um, what was of interest to you and why it was important for you to run for the Republican Party of Texas chair. Well, I mean, I've, I've been an activist, uh, volunteer, uh, a, a supporter of the Republican Party since I was 16 years old, and I worked my first gubernatorial campaign in Connecticut, where I grew up. Uh, and I moved to Texas 2001. Um, it's been about 20 years, uh, and I've been an activist since I've moved to Texas. I've been very involved with the Dallas GOP. Uh, I've been a precinct chair, uh, attended, I think, four or five conventions over the last 10 years. Uh, my wife's been a precinct chair, so we've been very active with the party. Um, and then I was served in the legislature from 2014 to 2019. I was blessed to be given the opportunity to, to serve and, and pass legislation that, you know, affected the people of Texas uh, in a positive way. Now, uh, I've been out of the legislature for about two years, but it's also one of the most important times politically I think we've ever had. Um, we have leftists taking over every cultural institution in America. Um, government right now is pretty much the last bulwark against the, the creeping Marxism in every aspect of American life, which is becoming increasingly more political in every way. Uh, so as Republican Party of Texas chair, I wanted to be able to affect uh, policy. I wanted to be able to affect winning elections. Um, and I want to be able to affect the messaging and branding of the Republican Party, what, what it means to be a Republican going forward, because it has to mean something more than just stopping Democrats. We have to go on offense. And I think that's very important. And that's why I ran for chair. No, look, you're absolutely right. And as I mentioned, you and I worked together in the legislature. We knew each other before you served in the legislature. And so you know, I look forward to, to interacting with you, with you more and your beautiful family, too. And it's great to have someone who has that background, right? The legislature. You also have a law background. You and I share that as well. Uh, being licensed attorneys, the impact that that can have. But the policy matters so much. Winning the elections matters so much. The Dallas-Fort Worth area, even areas in Houston and other parts of the state, there's been some elections that haven't gone the way many of us wanted them to go. And you got to win in order to have those people in the legislature to have those votes to make a difference on those policies. And so all that is very important. And right now it's interesting, right? You're, you're elected. And so people may not be aware of this, but the SREC, the Senate Republican Executive Committee, which is 64 members, they took a vote and uh, there was a couple of other candidates and there was David Covey got several votes, but you had a pretty strong margin. And, and from everything I see, people coming together now, okay, we had an election, we're all Republicans, let's stay united. Talk to us a little bit about though, 
just a few details about what the state Republican Party of Texas, what the chairman's role is and, um, and, and what some of what that'll help people understand how this impacts them and why it matters. So, I mean, you have to start with the mission of the party itself. The mission of the party uh, is to promote conservative principles, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, to promote conservative principles and to build the infrastructure uh, that, that makes it possible to accomplish that. Uh, so that's what the, the chair does. It's uh, in building infrastructure, it's hiring people, um, obviously fundraising, both for payroll, for hiring the boots on the ground, and for uh, building a strong uh, election team for the run-up to the election, and then election integrity on election day operations. We uh, recruit candidates, we, um, we message, we uh, obviously have to fundraise in order to do all of this. And, and that's basically our job. Our job is to elect Republican candidates and then um, set legislative priorities in a platform to give them a guide as to, to what, they, what they should do when they're in office. Well, look, every two years, the Republican Party of Texas puts on a statewide convention. Many people say it's the largest Republican convention not only in the country, in the world, if you will. And so that's a major event that goes along with it. Sometimes that's people's only kind of touch with some of these things. And so that's going to be an interesting part of this dynamic as well. But right now, there's a lot going on that relates to what's happening at the legislature and the role that the Republican Party of Texas has. And I want to talk a little bit about that because we're in the middle of a special session. Governor Abbott's made it clear that he will call another or as many special sessions as it takes to get those things done. Let's talk about some of those policies that matter to Republicans, but also to many Texans that may not identify with one party or the other, or that might not matter as much to them. But a lot of these things are unifying principles that we've seen the Senate already getting take care of. But now we're, you know, we've got the House Democrats that are holding things up for a quorum. But let's talk about some of those, those main issues that um, are in play in the focus of the special session that from your perspective as the chairman of the Republican Party of Texas are important? Yeah, well, if you go online, uh, your, your listeners can look at our party platform, which hits, I mean, issues that you wouldn't even think a party platform hits. It's, it's very detailed and, and takes a position on just about every issue you can think of. Um, from that group, we set eight legislative priorities, which we were going to focus on for the special sessions of the regular legislative sessions. Um, those legislative priorities include um, uh, election integrity, which is obviously very important and the reason why Democrats fled. We're dealing with that in the special session. Um, religious freedom, uh, banning uh, gender modification of children, uh, abolition of abortion, constitutional carry, uh, monument protection, protecting our history, uh, school choice for all in banning taxpayer funded lobby. Um, now, many of those issues have either already been dealt with in a legislative session or are on the call for the special session. Some of them have yet to be put on the call like banning child gender modification. And we're working hard to try to convince um, Governor Abbott to put that on the call. Yeah. So, um, well, you know, and I'm curious if you've heard anything on the issue too, gender modification. You know, we've been working on this issue for probably close to two years. You've got the big case, not too far from where your district or you call home, um, your former house district is up in the Dallas area, the case regarding this young boy uh, from the younger family. You've got the father that's been involved. You've got James, the little boy that's been involved in this. But I mean, it's, you know, this has been a growing concern, not only because of that case, but of the medical community in some parts of the state and being involved in these procedures where children will really mutilate their body. And oftentimes it's irreversible. We had some things that were advanced by Matt Kraus and others during the session, didn't get it done. And I'm hearing it was reported earlier this week that Governor Abbott's office has some kind of plan to address this. You're right, it's not on the call. And I've inquired as well. We still don't have any information or details of what that looks like. I'm encouraged that he's messaging that he's gonna do something but, you know, we want to make sure we get something done, too. And so I think we're kind of you're probably in the same position. We're just waiting to find out what those details are. Yeah. Look, Governor Abbott needs to put it on the call. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's I think a, it would be it's a unifying problem. issue that appeals to not only Republicans. It's not even a partisan issue. It appeals to independents 
uh, and, and logically thinking non-political people. I mean, I, I always do the, the hockey locker room test, right? When I'm going to my hockey game and all my non-political friends are talking about stuff um, and they're talking about, you know, the younger case and how ridiculous it is. And they're getting passionate about it. This is stuff we can use to grow the party and bring people in. Now, I know Governor Abbott said he was going to do something executive order wise, but he said he didn't think it could get through the House. Well, make them vote on it. Put it on yeah, the call. No, so, absolutely. I mean, you're the, he's the governor. He can put it on the call. And, and look, yeah. the Senate's ready to take take care of business. Um, and, you know, look, that's a meeting with Speaker Phelan. The, the members, from my understanding, they're ready to do it. So whether that means that the speaker is holding things up or you've got some people in leadership that are, you know, negatively impacting the process. My understanding when we talked to members, they were ready to get it done. I'm with you. Let's put it on the call. Let's get it done. You know, during the regular session, there was a hearing on this House Bill 1399 by Matt Krause. It was crazy. I mean, it was the wild, wild west, okay, mm -hmm. to hear some of these so-called medical experts come up. And here was the other thing that was interesting. When you looked at the list of procedures that were in Matt Krause's bill, so many of them said, oh, we don't do any of that. And so one of the legislators said, well, great. So when we ban it, it's not going to impact you. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry. Sometimes we might do some of these procedures. I mean, it's this has got to be dealt with because uh, clearly there's no accountability in this so-called medical community. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when you look at or, or I honesty, mean, <laughs> I know exactly. Well, when you look at online, it's very interesting. You find online a uh, business plan for the Genesis Clinic, with, which is the UT Southwestern Children's Hospital Clinic that actually does this kind of stuff in Dallas. And you look at the business plan, and it's completely horrifying. I mean, it is actually horrifying. They're building their number. I mean, we're talking hundreds of kids per year running through this, this program. And what the legislature is going to do, hopefully, Matt Krause's bill would put them out of business. Thank God. Um, but, you know, every victory we've had in the Texas House that I can think of um, was a victory on a bill that the House didn't want to pass. Leadership didn't want to pass. And because it, it's tough to have people coming in to have that Wild West here. They don't like that. They like to come into work, honor people in the gallery. And, and you know, a lot of people like it to be easy. But it's not easy. See, when you put them to a vote, they'll vote for it. Well, you just got to put them to a vote. Yeah, look, and I'll hear people say this sometimes. Why are y'all getting into these controversial issues? They're taking so much time. They're taking, a, they don't take a lot of time. Look at the Senate, right? Yeah. It doesn't take long to pass a bill. You put it on there. Sometimes it takes about five or 10 seconds, you know, in the House. And pe some people aren't paying attention. Things can get done very quickly. And when so certain people get out of the way or leadership, whoever gives an opportunity for the members to vote. Let's talk about another issue, election integrity, speaking of policy issues during this se special session, but also relate to election outcomes, which the Republican Party of Texas cares a lot about. We hear the slogan a lot. We want to make it easy to vote, hard to cheat. I just got back from D.C. I didn't see the Texas House Democrats when I was there. I wasn't necessarily particularly looking for them. That's not why I was up there. But this seems inevitable. We saw this happen in 2003. At some point, they're going to have to come back. At some point, there'll be an opportunity. And I think they've uh, created a climate where you're now going to see a stronger bill. You're going to see more unity. What are your thoughts on this issue? Well, I hope they do. They can go one of two ways. They can start negotiating with Democrats and make it weaker, or they can make it stronger and set an example. And I, I think you, you really do need to set an example. Otherwise, this will happen again as a negotiating tactic on other bills. Um, you can't give an inch. You have to go um, even stronger when the Democrats pull stunts like this, or else they'll do it again. And by the way, the election integrity bill, the way the way it was written, is incredibly easy. Makes it incredibly easy to vote. I mean, they're expanding early voting. I mean, I personally, in my personal opinion, not not the parties necessarily, but my personal opinion is, I don't agree with early voting at all. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know a lot of people feel that way. <laughs> And, you know, so you, you think it's like, well, what's the what's the purpose here? It's like, but I, I know there's value in it. But to your point, a lot of that's just being ignored. People aren't even reading the bill. We're not surprised by that to some extent. How many times, you know, issues have we gone through, worked on where you're like, nobody's reading the bill. They're, they're sticking to certain talking points. But that does matter. I mean, when you talk about what the law is going to be, the words of the law, the legislation, 
it does matter. And if you actually look at it, there's tremendous value in the opportunities it allows in the freedom that it has so more people can be a part of the voting process. This has just become a political issue uh, largely to where the Democrats think somehow they've got to come out ahead. Um, and if the, any bill passes, somehow that they've lost. But, you know, if you start looking at those details, I think a lot of people will see that common ground. But I mean, that's going to mean the House Democrats come back. But I just think to your point, it's an opportunity to say, you know, let's get something strong if they're going to make it more difficult. And this could have been done at the end of the special, uh, the regular session. And they chose to uh, to really force there to be an extension of all this. And we'll see how that plays out in the elections. There's some yeah. polling out there that suggests this is hurting Democrats. I mean, what are you seeing? I mean, is the Republican Party seeing that this is creating a climate where uh, maybe Republicans have a better chance to reclaim some seats? Yeah, no, it's definitely helping us electorally. I think it's helping us in fundraising, helping us electorally, because the Democrats in Texas are a disaster. I mean, see Michelle Beck giving Michelle Beckley the national spotlight is the greatest thing you can ever do for Republicans. It's amazing. Well, I, um, I, look, I put I retweeted some of her videos because I just couldn't believe whoever's in charge of her communications put some of that up. I mean, you know, just because you do a national interview doesn't mean that you put all that stuff up if it doesn't go well. And it went horribly, if you will, it's several such, of them. Such a clown show between the Miller light, everything going on has just been a clown show. I mean, more seriously, you have Raphael Anchia, the Democrat, uh, one of the Democrats who coordinated the walkout uh, in 2007, came out very strongly and specifically and said, mail-in ballots are the greatest source of voter fraud in the state and questioned whether not having photo ID for mail-in ballots would result in more fraud. So, you know, look, uh, well, and I mean, you're expecting Rafael and Chia, you know, to be consistent or to be professional, if you will. I, I, if I was, you know, uh, still waiting for a meeting with him that I was promised, I'd be still be sitting in his office like I was in a chair for an hour and a half watching him walk back and forth, never getting that meeting. But, you know, look, I mean, and that's interesting, right? You do your history and you're like, Wait a minute, you're you're with us on the policy. So it's it's become about something much more. But I do think some people are seeing that. And I think it's going to hurt them when it comes to elections. So but there's only a, a week or so left in this regular session. And if you do the math, I think on some of the quarantine for some of these members, it doesn't look like they're going to be back by, by August 7th. We'll see what happens. The governor said he'll call as many special sessions as necessary to get this done. It's good to see that commitment, but I think from your perspective, whether it's elections and so on, the grassroots, SREC, it's important to sort of keep that attention and pressure on so people know the people of Texas are with the members and others that want to get this done. Yeah, and there also needs to be consequences for the walkout, too. Um, the governor should put every one of our GOP priorities on the call, including gender modification and in the existing items you already did put on the call. And we, you know, there needs to be ramifications. A lot of these Democrats that left are committee chairs. Anyone who has left should never be a committee chair again in a Republican controlled house. And they should be removed this session as well. Well, look, and we're seeing a, a few of those moves being made. We'll see if more of them will be made. I wanna just one issue too. The Save Women Sports issue has passed the Texas Senate. There's a pro-life bill that puts some regulations in place so we don't have uh, abortion pills going through the mail and flooding uh, young women and being misused by people that are involved in criminal activity. There was a hearing a week or so ago. Um, those bills are moving forward. And on the Save Women Sports issue, one of the things Senator Charles Perry said was they've seen a 3,800% increase on people seeking to change their birth certificate. And oh, by the way, you don't have to have any medical procedure to change your birth certificate. Apparently in the state of Texas, you can socially transition if you will, which just means you say you just want to, I don't know, whatever you come up with that you want to go from a man or a boy to a girl. This could really devastate sports. We're already seeing problems with that, but this has got to get done in the house. And, and I'm encouraged that issue is on the call, but the gender modification and look, I say, let's get some more pro-life stuff done, done while we're at it as well. Load it up. I mean, yeah. ser seriously, Democrats want to walk out. There needs to be ramifications. Load up the call. And we saw from the Texas Senate, I mean, they're operating like a well-oiled machine, right? They only have one Democrat committee chair, yet they didn't have the walkout that busted quorum, and they're passing our Republican priorities very quickly. 
I, I'd yeah, love well, to see that out of the house too. And that's how quickly things can get done when people stay focused, when you've got that leadership, which we're seeing with our lieutenant governor. And so, look, I know you got some work to do. I kept you a little bit longer than I said we would, but it's great. Congratulations on being elected the chair of the Republican Party of Texas. We know you bring a lot of experience to the table, a lot of focus on the policy issues. Couldn't be a better time for all of that to come together in the middle of a special session. And what we can expect is a, another special session to come if necessary. So, Chairman Matt Rinaldi of the Republican Party of Texas has been our guest today on the Texas Values Report. Thanks for having me. You bet. All right, I got a little bit more time, just a few minutes to do some wrap up. We're going to let Chairman Rinaldi go. But, you know, look, I was in D.C., OK, this week, and I didn't go, as I said, to look for Texas Democrats. I went up there to meet with other state leaders that are a part of family policy councils throughout the state of Texas. There are about 40 groups like ours in other states. There's typically one that sort of is the representative of the state. A lot of that flows from a association, longtime association and relationship with focus on the family. And then in coordination with groups like Family Research Council, Alliance Defending Freedom, they were represented at this meeting that I was at, this conference during the week. Um, March for Life had representatives there. By the way, did you see the national interview that I got that we did on EWTN? This is one of the largest media outlets in the world, particularly when it comes to pro-life issues. We were on the Pro-Life Weekly program talking about what's going on with the Texas heartbeat law. And uh, had about a seven or eight minute segment, some pretty good time in there. If you didn't see it, we got that on our social media sites. But their office was pretty close to where I was meeting in D.C. Arena Grosu from our team's got some relationships there. So we got connected with them. And it was a really good time to do that. Um, and look, this is the largest Catholic media entity just south, if you will, or number two under the Vatican. OK, so they get a lot of attention, a lot of exposure. And we want people to know about that. What's going on with the Texas heartbeat law? Why is it different than other heartbeat laws? And is this legal approach and strategy we're using? Can other states and other parts of the country use it? We say yes. And so that's talked about. Obviously, there was a lawsuit against the heartbeat law. We think it's going to fail. Um, without question. So if you didn't see that, check our social media sites. I had a really good time being there and connecting uh, with some new folks that I had sort of been in touch with on social media. But just to get that FaceTime, that airtime on video, and to really be able to touch people, we know there are a lot of people in Texas that access that program and that entity EWTN for a lot of their news. So I hope you enjoyed it. You had not seen it yet, check it out. But you know, look, I was in DC. I didn't see the, te the Texas House Democrats. I got close to the U.S. Capitol. Uh, we weren't able to get meetings in there, but we had a congressional reception. I believe it was called the Capitol Club that were, um, where we had a number of members. We had Kevin McCarthy there. We had Steve Scalise. Congressman Chip Roy from Texas was there. We spent a little bit of time together and all these groups got together to hear what the members are thinking about the issues of faith and family. There's a pro-life issue they're working on to make sure that we've got some regulations, particularly on college campuses. So girls are not getting these abortion pills through the mail. Um, which are a lot of times used by wep as weapons by sexual uh, sex traffickers and others used to cover up rape and things of this nature. And so it, it really can be concerning. Chip Roy did give a speech at this event, really appreciated his presence, as well as people like Jeff Fortenberry, uh, um, uh, Vicki Hartzler. There were a number of people. I'm, I probably can't go down the whole list that were there, but it was fantastic. And like I said, getting together with other state groups, I was able to present on a panel to talk about the Texas heartbeat law, to talk about this legal approach we have, what's going on with the lawsuit against the Texas heartbeat law, letting them see the video from the Biden administration, press secretary, where they say it's the strictest abortion law of its type in the country, maybe ever. Hey, guilty as charged, if you will. But we're going to continue to back up and support the effort to protect the Texas heartbeat law. As a matter of fact, we've got a website, a new website up, texasheartbeatlaw.com. You can download a one pager. Start getting ready to enforce this law. This is the law you get to enforce as a citizen. You can file a civil action to do that. You can contact our office to get some more details about that, how that's done. It's different. It's unique. But the state of Louisiana has done this before. So it's not new in that sense. The, court, the federal court of appeals has upheld this approach as constitutional. So we know we've got some legal backing when it comes to those issues as well. But you know, as far as what's going to be happening in the special session, not a lot to update as far as official activity, because nothing's happened. We're still waiting for the Texas House Democrats to get some things done in the Texas House. 
we see a little bit of shifting, some Democrats getting nervous and coming back to the Capitol, but a big bulk of them, I think, uh, at least appear to still be in D.C. So we'll see how that continues to play out. Governor Abbott, as I mentioned, talking to Chairman Rinaldi, says the gender modification issue, he's going to come out with something, I guess, this week or soon, where he's going to um, try to have an impact and address these issues. We would support it being on the call. We've we've um, made that request to him um, directly. And so but we'll see what happens. I mean, we want to get something done on this issue. So, you know, look, I, we'll wait and see what he's doing before we suggest that it's not, you know, um, that we can't it can't be handled that way. But I do think if we have a state law, that could be something more long term. We might have something that has some some pretty strong teeth to it. I have not seen the details yet. But um, so we're going to be waiting and see as soon as we have something from the governor's office that we know of that's public, we will share it with our members. We'll have some commentary on it. But I am encouraged that the governor's office and the governor himself sees this as an important issue and they want to get something done. So we're going to try to do what we can uh, to address that, to build on that and to make sure that something is enforced so we can address this issue. It's long overdue. And the legislature had an opportunity to do that and they didn't get it done. Primarily the Texas House did not complete some of the work they should have done on this, in my opinion. I think it's fair to ask, is that because of a breakdown at the top and leadership from Speaker Phelan? We'll see what they have to say about this when the Governor Abbott comes out with his proposal. But hey, we're just about out of time. I had a great time in DC. I'm always glad to be back. I really don't like traveling to DC, but I will do it to coordinate with other friends so we can bring it back to Texas to make sure we get great work done on faith, family and freedom in Texas. And you can support us at txvalues.org. And we'll talk to you next week on the Texas Values Report.